And a very warm welcome to this special edition of Middle East Matters on Iraq. I'm Sanam Chantier. Coming up, reconstruction is underway in Iraq's Anbar province one year after the defeat of the Islamic State group. Baghdad's Green Zone reopens in parts. The area, home to foreign embassies and key ministries, has been off limits to ordinary Iraqis since the 2003 US-led invasion. Also coming up, Flavors of Iraq. We speak to uh, Furat uh, Alani, an Iraqi French journalist, about his animation, which will be featuring here on Middle East Matters over the next 20 weeks. In December 2017, then Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi officially declared victory over the Islamic State group in Iraq. And uh, the western province of Anbar was one of the militant strongholds. Unlike other parts of northern Iraq that continue to suffer from the extremist group's resurgence, today Anbar is deemed to be relatively safe. But the pace of reconstruction has been rather slow. Here's a report from our correspondents on the ground. At Fallujah's train station, the only train of the day is ready for boarding. The daily service to the capital Baghdad resumed in July, two years after government forces retook Fallujah from the Islamic State group. A prefab serves as a temporary ticketing hall. Across the tracks, the old station still lies in ruins. But the train has brought welcome respite. Of course it's practical. The train takes you directly, without traffic, chaos and overcrowding caused by the checkpoints. The reopening of the Baghdad Fallujah line is one of the few successful reconstruction projects in Anbar province, but there are limited government funds to rebuild all the infrastructure that has been damaged during the latest war. In nearby Ramadi, the provincial government building remains a pile of rubble. Buried underneath are unexploded ordinances and plans for a better future that never came to fruition. Before the Islamic State group entered the city, the municipality had more than 660 projects on the go. We are still trying to catch up to the level we were at before the ISIS group arrived. At Ramadi's half-destroyed yet overcrowded teaching hospital, patients and doctors alike are brimming with frustration at the lack of care. The blood clot test this patient needs isn't available in all of Anbar. Anything that's expensive isn't available. They're stingy with the citizens. I don't know if they simply do not purchase these items or they divert them. The education sector is equally neglected. High school completion rates hover at a shocking 15 percent. The mayor warns that lack of opportunities for the youth could once again destabilize the region. There's a huge gap. This could pose a real threat in the future and give rise to extremism. Baghdad has allocated $113 million for Anbar in 2019, the lowest of all provincial budgets. Without adequate funds, many fear that the former Islamic State group stronghold will struggle to get back on track. Now, since the U.S.-led invasion in 2003 that toppled Saddam Hussein, the Green Zone has been inaccessible to most Iraqi civilians. But the government has been reopening some parts of the high-security area over the past weeks. Yuka Hoyach has a report. July 2004. American troops hand over control of the Green Zone in Baghdad, a high-security enclave in the heart of the Iraqi capital set up the previous year, following the US invasion and the toppling of Saddam Hussein. In reality, with frequent insurgent attacks, Western forces continued to control the zone until 2009. And the forbidding concrete walls surrounding it stood for nearly a decade more, becoming a symbol of social segregation in Iraq. This area has been closed for the past 15 years. It represented a state of class distinction between the people and politicians. As well as foreign embassies, the Green Zone housed the Iraqi government ministries and parliament. It provided safety to the political elite, while being off limits to most Iraqis. The area often became a prime destination for protesters, voicing their anger at politicians isolating themselves from the public. Demonstrators stormed the parliament in 2016. The new government, elected last October, was the first since 2003 to hold a cabinet meeting outside the Green Zone. We want to consider all of Iraq as a Green Zone, rather than some areas green and others red. It was also a demonstration of growing confidence by Iraqi leaders about improved security in the country, following its costly victory over the Islamic State group. 
However, sporadic suicide and rocket attacks have continued this year, calling the government's assessment of the security situation into question. This week, I'd like to welcome Furat Alani, a French Iraqi journalist uh, who's also authored Flavors of Iraq, a series of short animations uh, which we'll be showing here on Middle East Matters over the next 20 weeks. The different episodes take us on a journey to Iraq with a young Furat at the age of nine. We discover his country through his eyes. We taste with him his favorite apricot ice cream. We even smell the gunpowder and hear the sound of bombings. Let's now watch the first episode of Flavors of Iraq. My name is Furat Alani. I'm French and Iraqi. In 1989, I was nine years old. These once mortal enemies must now meet to make peace. Such a reversal can be explained in one word, exhaustion. The conflict has ended with no winner, only loss. The war between Iran and Iraq had just come to an end. At last, I was able to discover my parents' country. My mother, my sister and I left for two months. My father couldn't come with us. In his youth, he was a political opponent and he feared returning home might still be risky. I landed at Baghdad airport. Once through customs, we were welcomed with oriental effusion. A hundred family members were waiting for us. My mother waved at them through the window that separated us. I was wearing a blue tie. Three impassive mustachioed men stood a little apart, my uncles from Fallujah. We formed a convoy of some 20 cars, music at full blast. I was struck by the country's modernity, highways, streetlights, American cars. We stopped at an ice cream parlor. I savored one of the best ice creams of my life, apricot flavor, the flavor of Baghdad. Two years later, when the embargo started in 1991, sugar imports became highly restricted. Ice cream could only be found on the black market, just like drugs. Amid car horns in our honor, my cousin whispered in my ear to never speak Saddam Hussein's name in the street. My sister thought it was a game. My cousin rushed us into her car. She was furious. For me and my sister, the party was over. I was nine years old. This was also my first taste of tyranny. Let's now bring in the author of uh, Flavors of Iraq, Furat Alani. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Now, the series is actually adapted from a thread of around 1,500 uh, tweets that you wrote during uh, 2016. Furat, why this medium? Why animation? Actually, I chose Twitter uh, with uh, a bit of provocation because on Twitter it goes really fast, especially uh, when you want to read some news. And uh, with Iraq, all the news that I had was uh, figures, numbers, death, violence, and war. So the idea was to counteract uh, this uh, trend, and it's in the light of those values that I, I wanted to give some details. And what's particularly interesting is that you mix this animation with documentary footage, at least audio, uh, of what really happened. Is that to hammer home the realities of this conflict? Exactly, so I wanted to show another side first, a very intimate side of what I saw in Iraq. And at the same time, I wanted to be really didactical about what was going on in Iraq with uh, giving some footage, as you said, uh, or information about what was going on there. So it's a kind of balance between very personal stories to give another picture and a bigger story about Iraq. 
You said you wanted to take an intimate look at what was going on. Can you give us one example of that? For example, in 95, uh, it was the worst period during the uh, embargo in Iraq, and uh, I had a very expensive shoes uh, on me, uh, and I was walking in the street, and uh, people were really interested in this, and one of them tried to exchange his car uh, against my shoes, and I was really shocked by this. It wasn't a joke, and I realized at that time that it was a very complicated situation, and uh, I felt really guilty about it. Absolutely, I can imagine. Now, yeah. something that we noticed when watching uh, this animation is that there are a lot of faces, but they're vague. Some of them have eyes and eyebrows, others have just mm. moustaches, as you can see here. Yes. What was the decision behind that? The way of telling this story is with the senses. I try to give smells, tastes, uh, flavours. And so the idea is that when you go back into memories or even dreams, you don't have a very precise uh, picture of the situation. So by doing this, when, for example, I smell the ice cream, you can see my nose coming up. And it's the, uh, a way to, uh, to give space to uh, the people who are watching it to have their own imagination about this situation. And what kind of reactions have you had? Because this is very much, it's a human look at what's been going on during this ongoing conflict. It's very important for me to give this aspect of, uh, of uh, the war. Uh, we, again, we are still talking about death, but I'm more focused about life. Uh, when you have war, you have to describe this. It's something that we have to do. But on the same, at the same time, we have to tell the story that is going on maybe 200 meters from the uh, violent situation that we, uh, we, uh, we are facing. So the idea is to just to, to give the whole picture of a story that is bigger than we, what we see in the news sometimes. Farhat Alani, author of Flavors of uh, Iraq, thank you so much for coming on Middle East Matters and we're really looking forward to showing your animation here over the coming weeks. Thank you very much. Now that's it for us this week. Uh, don't forget you can reach out to us on Facebook and Twitter. That's Middle East Matters at France 24. Thank you for watching.